Welcome to Partners in Healthcare. My name is Gary Removich, Director for the Physician Assistant Program at Wingate University. Today we're on the road. We're in Concord, North Carolina at Cabarrus Family Medicine. It's a pleasure for me to have two distinguished uh, healthcare providers with me. Dr. Alan Dobson is a native of North Carolina. He has undergraduate education from North Carolina State University. He attended medical school at Bowman Gray School of Medicine at Wake Forest and completed his residency in family medicine at East Carolina University, where he served as chief resident. After finishing medical training, Dr. Dobson founded Mount Pleasant Family Physicians and served as president until, until assuming the role of director of Cabarrus Family Medicine Residency in 1995. He is the president and CEO of Cabarrus Family Medicine. He has been actively involved in public health policy on the state and national level. He was an early leader and developer of the nationally recognized community care of North Carolina primary care based Medicaid managed care program. In 2005, he was appointed Assistant uh, Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, where he was responsible for health divisions of the department as well as serving as a state Medicaid director. In September 2007, he stepped down from his state appointment to become Vice President for Clinical Practice Development for Carolina's health care system and sir, returned as President of Cabarrus Family Medicine. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Dr. Dobson. We also have uh, a physician assistant, Tom Earnhardt, is a North Carolina native, originally from Rocky Mount, who grew up in Mount Pleasant area. He completed his undergraduate training at Pfeiffer University, where he received a BS in biology, and completed his PA training at Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. He obtained his master's degree in health administration from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Mr. Earnhardt serves as Vice Senior Vice President, Chief Operating Officer for Cabarrus Family Medicine and is currently a member of the Board of Directors of, of the North Carolina Healthcare Information Communications Alliance. Mr. Earnhardt has a special interest in computerized patient medical records and has spent countless hours working toward electronic data interchange and commerce. It's a pleasure to have you with us as well. Thanks. I'd like to know how did you both uh, discover each other and how did you become uh, collaborators uh, in uh, Cabrera's family medicine? Well, it, it goes back to 25 years in, in 1983. I uh, um, was recruited to Mount Pleasant, a small rural community uh, just east of here, about 1,200 people, um, to help take over a practice of a retiring physician who had been there 35 years or 37 years. Um, and uh, shortly after that, uh, you know, Tom needed a clinical rotation and uh, from Emory and wanted to come back home to, to do that and um, we hit it off and um, I convinced him to stay on, which Very is good. so we've been partners for uh, 25 years. Very good. And so you were a PA 25 years ago? I was the second PA in Cabarrus County. Just the second PA in second. Cabarrus County? That's correct. Very good. And uh, how long have you been uh, involved in um, data? Exchange and uh, healthcare <laughs> records. Actually, that dates back to the uh, to the uh, late '80s and early '90s. Um, we had an interest in developing uh, clinical records and uh, and getting the correct information to the physician and provider's hands uh, at the point of care. So that's where it really started. Uh, actually, before uh, electronic records became the real buzzword in, in America. Very good. Um, one of the concerns that uh, many people have is access to health care. Um, what do you see as one of the greatest needs for health care access, especially here in North Carolina? Enough primary care physicians. I mean, and, and I think pr primary care providers. I, I, I think our, you know, I trained at East Carolina in family medicine, and, and even in the early 80s, it was pretty, we had uh, PAs in, in the program. Um, as part of the residency and, and we were taught in team care even, yes. even that far back and and so um, you know when we were looking for how we we're going to provide care to Mount Pleasant uh, being the only um, health care provider um, in about a 15 mile radius I see um, and my partner and I at that time were trying to make rounds at the hospital carry hospital practice do obstetrics as well is provide good access for the community. 
um, having uh, having Tom as our partner in that adventure, we could go to the hospital, he could take calls, see people in the office. Uh, it, it made that, you know, the ability to serve that population uh, uh, easier. And I think that's going to be a challenge, as it, particularly in areas where um, there's a need for more primary care. Uh, we just don't have the supply uh, to serve that. And do you see that uh, PAs are uh, qualified to really help a family physician uh, take care of primary care needs? Yeah, uh, very much so. Uh, there's there's a lot of standardization uh, across the system that uh, we're all trained um, alongside physicians to to treat the most common uh, disease processes and um, and particularly chronic disease is a very important area that, that needs more focus. And uh, simply with all the uh, the research that as as time goes by. Um, it just becomes impossible to meet all the mm -hmm. all the, the uh, care needs that each individual has. And physicians, um, they're just as you mentioned, there's just not enough supply to, to meet uh, meet those demands. Yeah. So I believe that physician extenders is one area that uh, they can can supply that that Very need. Good. Very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think uh, <coughs> you know clearly it's two two great areas where. Um, Having uh, a physician assistant a as with uh, primary care physicians make a difference. One is in, in access, uh, you know, basic access to care for um, f for routine healthcare sure. needs. Uh, it allows physicians to um, stay open longer, you know, provide more walk-in appointments, really serve the community better. And as I said in early days when we were trying to go to the hospital, um, that was essential. Mm -hmm. uh, the other part, as Tom mentioned, is in chronic disease management, and, and is be that becomes more and more important for managing healthcare costs and healthcare reform. Sure, we're we're clearly going to have to have uh, inf increased emphasis on team care, um, uh, particularly around those those high need diseases, and and as our population ages, you know whether we get back and start doing home visits or extend sure. our reach uh, in communities um, beyond just the office setting. Having a, a healthcare team is going to be important. Very good. One of the areas of concern is many physicians are not going into family practice or primary care. Um, what do you think are some of the reasons for that? Well, I think um, it, it probably relates to some of the reasons that uh, um, even in PAs and nurse practitioners, they tend, you know, we're seeing a migration away from primary care into you know specialty care. One is. Um, reimbursement work, sure. uh, you know, work hours, um, you know, the hassles of practice, um, uh, being overburdened, trying to, you know, do a job where you don't have enough people there to help. The demands out to, you know, outstrip your, your ability sure. to deliver those. So I think uh, that's certainly an issue. And even if we were able to, with health reform, you know, rebalance that. The ability to get a, a physician, a new primary care physician out there is a, a seven year process. Yes. So you're talking about the supply chain being seven to ten years behind the need. And, and so I think there's going to be an increased need to for finding ways to get mid-level pr practitioners connected with our pr family physicians and primary care physicians out in the community. Uh, the other part is how do you get them distributed right? Sure. Uh, yes. you know, and it's the same, you know, just like specialty choice, you know, people migrate to the cities where, you know, they have, there are more resources and their lifestyle's not sure. it, it quite as much as an issue. I'm, I'm not so sure it's necessarily a fact that it's uncomfortable living in a small town. But if you're in a small town and you have no, and you're overworked and right. not enough resources, You've got two strikes against you. Sure. One of the things you've mentioned is that uh, family physicians very often feel burned out. Right. That uh, the amount of work that they are required to provide with minimal reimbursement is something that can be overwhelming. Uh, do PAs have problems with uh, with burnout, or is is there something that they they enjoy about their practice that might be a little bit unusual? Well, certainly burnout is always um, an issue in in any sector of healthcare. Mm -hmm. Be nurses or nurse assistant, 
physicians, mid-level practitioners. Uh, so it's always a concern. Uh, and you know, the, 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 uh, the work that we do is very stressful. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's just, uh, that's nature of the beast. And, mm-hmm. and uh, you really do have to pay attention and, and try to figure ways that you can prevent some of that. Um, that was one of the things that I recognized early on with, with these young guys starting up a new practice, I saw that they were killing themselves. Uh, yes. Just, you know, trying to uh, manage the clinic and then drive to the hospital for uh, rounds at lunchtime, get back to the clinic oh, in the goodness. afternoon. And then I'd see them, you know, staying late after work and, and doing managerial type things, a payroll, paying the staff and so forth. And uh, where I trained, there was uh, one of my uh, professors had given me a piece of advice uh, early on uh, that said, you know, if you want to be a good physician extender, you look to your supervising physician and you watch them and you determine where can you fit the need and where can you improve their lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And if you go in and fit that, um, uh, you feel the bill and, and make, that, um, make that change and you take a piece of that workload off of them, then you'll make yourself indispensable. That's part of this being a team. Well, I, I think right. I, I'll echo that. I think that's uh, you know, we we tell our you know young family physicians uh, about what is it a family physician does, and and I usually respond whatever the community needs them to do. Yes, because I think ultimately the training in a, a family medicine is that you know we're broadly trained and it you see different styles of practice, but it's it's basically meeting the needs of that community. If you're in a rural area, you you will do a whole lot of uh, medicine because there may not be any other resources so you may end up doing some orthopedics and and, and you'll, your scope of practice may be much broader than you would if you were in inner city Charlotte sure. where it may much be lo- um, more constrained. The same thing with uh, um, PAs. I think uh, finding that niche of how they can help and, and I'll say that's it didn't take me long to be sold. It, it, it was extremely helpful to have Tom as a partner. I yes. think um, if you think about a practice in a small town where there was two physicians, even three physicians, and we're taking call every third night and doing OB and and, and potentially being up and then having the, the being able to get back to the to the hospital, sure. having him be on call with us meant that I didn't get the phone calls. I didn't have to go to clinic after hours to see a patient. My only risk was if I had to go in for a delivery or sure. he could help. You know, mm-hmm. ease ease my uh, lifestyle burden of trying to serve a small community, particularly in the early days. Sure. Um, before we mm-hmm. recruited more and more, you know, folks in, and and then as we got more partners, it allowed us to be open on Saturday and hours that you typically wouldn't be able to do as a one or two doctor uh, uh, practice. So again, it, it is finding the right uh, right way to. Um, ex- Extend yourself by sure. having a, a partner in that, and I think you know, I think we're realizing that. I mean, the the detriment to, of the healthcare system has been we haven't invested in primary care, right? And and and, and PAs and nurse practitioners are going to be a big part of that in the future, particularly in these team practices. And you're seeing the discussion of patient-centered medical home, which is, you know, the, that whole concept is is basically team-based primary care. Yes, and. and so I think it is an exciting time for uh, primary care physicians and for PAs. And uh, PAs can be flexible, okay. that they have flexibility. Someone has said that uh, PAs are like a stem cell medical person okay. uh, because they can see what the needs are and then fill those needs. And, and there's a kinship, I think, between family medicine and that because it sure. goes back to what I said before. Family physicians are so broadly trained that is they end up being what their, what their uh, community needs them to be. Sure. So, I think that's extremely uh, important to, to, to um, uh, understand that uh, it's okay. It, it's okay, and you figure out what your community needs and what your practice needs are, and you fill them with a team of professionals that can serve the community. One of the, the problems is very often uh, physicians aren't too sure how to utilize a PA. And uh, there's been some talk about uh, training PAs alongside physicians and nurses and other health care providers. Well, I think that's good. I think that's a, a real opportunity for the Winget program as well. Is to, uh, and, 
And I would say, I, we were talking bef before this about your location yes. being out of inner city uh, gives you a, a potential for a model of training sites that are uh, well geared to, to model that. Um, and I think that's something we need to look at nationally with the patient center medical home is really sure. rediscover the scope of those relationships and models for that could be successful. <clears throat> I think there's, you know, as we look at some of our smaller rural hospitals and physicians no longer go to the hospital, there's opportunity for uh, PAs as extension of hospitalists in, in a hospital setting where we have trouble recruiting enough physicians to man that. Um, the opportunities are great. We, we just need to explore how best to, to, to utilize, uh, you know, our mid-level practitioners. Very good. Mm -hmm. One of the areas that I think is interesting is that PAs can specialize, but part of their recertification process is in primary care, right. that they must maintain those, uh, those uh, broad skills. Uh, do you think that's uh, uh, valuable? For, for PAs. It is, and, uh, and we, we have to recertify every six years yes. uh, by uh, passing the national board. Um, and of course, once you're, when you're in the cycle and it's your sixth year and you have to retest, that's always uh, creates a bit of anxiety. But, but uh, you know, overall, it's a very good thing. It keeps uh, even the uh, mid levels that are in the specialty areas. It does um, sort of force you to, to maintain those uh, basic level of skills and, and information that uh, wow, might be out there. Like but, and I, I would agree. I think the, the big thing that's missing in medical education um, for physicians is that we no longer require that initial internship year for specialists to be broad-based. Yes. And, and so I think having the understanding of the patient's entire health care need and, and um, more than the narrow specialty is, is important. And, and knowing how to relate to the primary care physician, um, even if you're in a specialty office, um, I think is something a, a, a PA can bring to a specialty practice. Um, that, you know, fill that, that need for communication back to the primary care. Very good. Um, as far as saving money for our our uh, health care system, uh, there's been a recent meeting where two trillion dollars will be saved over the next ten years by reducing the amount of uh, of increase in payment. Um, what do you see as the greatest way to save money for the health care system? Well, I think uh, there's there's pretty good evidence out out there um, that investing in the primary care system will save money. And, and it, it's not in regulating services yes. uh, as we've seen over the last couple decades with more and more managed care piece, but giving base, patients bac basic access to care and good coordination of care saves money. <clears throat> and, and if you look nationally, um, there are some pockets where we show that if you have primary, good primary care access, their cost is less than those places those of the country who have lots of specialists, lots of hospitals, um, such as North e the northeastern part of the state, but no primary care. Yes. Their cost is extremely, uh, uh, magnitudes higher than other parts of the country. Yes. And, and even if you look at other countries, other industrialized countries that, that you know, have better outcomes and pay less, people get focused on the fact that it's you know, government health care or socialized medicine. And the reality is, if you if you really look beyond that um, at the common denominator, multiple m most of those countries, it is the fact they've invested in a a fairly robust and coordinated primary care infrastructure underneath all that. So how it's paid for is, I, at least in my estimation, is not the is not what saves them the money. It's the primary care system. It, it is the the robust primary care system they have. Yes. And, and so I think if this country is to really deliver on that, it, it's not up here with the payment structure and it's not in the regulatory structure. It's really, you know, investing our basic primary care and public health infrastructure, which is what's going to do that. And, and I think the patient-centered medical home is a, a, a great a way to at least 
articulate that. Yes. Um, because it does recognize the fact that primary care is not just physicians, it's not just a building, and it's not just fee-for-service medicine when people come in, it's the relationship over time. Yes. It's using teammates in, in that process, and it's taking responsibility for a set of patients over time, which we understood in Mount Pleasant. When we went there, we were the community's doctor, right. and, and it's whatever the community needed. Uh, and we ended up taking people who care people at times on weekends that weren't our patients. Really? But, yes. but we were in the community and that's what was expected. And, yes. and so I think getting back to that is essential in healthcare reform. One of the areas of concern is a lot of people don't have a primary care provider, so they use the emergency room as their primary care provider. Why is that bad? Well, that's, uh, that's the most expensive part of healthcare. Uh, go to the emergency room and that's uh, you're paying higher cost and um, uh, when it's really not necessary uh, and having the uh, having a primary care base that you can uh, that's accessible and, and available even uh, after normal business hours is, is important to uh, to give these uh, patients an alternative to uh, uh, to receiving the care that they need especially in the acute setting Many of these uh, patients will actually end up using the emergency department as their primary care office, right. uh, which is the most expensive care. Right. Well, and it is a former payer, I would, I, you know, running a Medicaid program. <clears throat> if that trend c continues, we have to build more emergency room beds, we have to expand, which is, and it's a huge fixed cost for hospitals, which then has to be paid for. Yes. And, and so it's, you know, obviously for, emergencies we need to provide that but for right. routine care. The other part is that when people use, you know, probably your best avenue to to a patient to intervene for something, it may not be why they came in. They may come in for a cold, they may come in because they have a, a problem that they perceive, but that's your opportunity to say, well have you had your preventive health care? Right. Can we get you back and get you know these other things? Oh, your blood pressure happens to be up. We'll we'll take care of that. So it's it's the notion that it's not just the one sh you know the acute visit. It's really the entree into a system to take care of people over time. Very good. And so what you're doing is trying to prevent catastrophic illness right. or disease. Right. And uh, so you can do that in the primary care setting when it's less expensive right. and the intervention is easier to be done. Well, and it's also that if, if you take the notion of the, the medical home, and we're understanding this more and more, more and more care needs to be provided, not just in a face-to-face -face encounter, but over time. It's the follow-up call. The follow -up. It's the bringing people back in. It's in, you know having that conversation um, and the, you know, if you just think beyond that, the use of a team with a, a physician, uh, a PA, maybe a pharmacist, clinical pharmacist, um, other health care providers in a setting that can really provide care for a larger group of patients, um, seems to me uh, what our citizens would want and find useful and would save money. Very good. As far as being the COO, uh, where do you see a way of, of actually reducing costs from your perspective for the healthcare system? Well, certainly, um, if you take your the team approach to chronic disease, is one of the areas that uh, I think we could save tons of money. And, and part of that, uh, we should mention um, as a tool, if we're talking about team approach, that means we have to have good communication between the physician, the, the physician extender, the dietitian, the pharmacist, and, and all the all the players uh, that are providing care for these patients. So, and to have that one, uh, one of the most important factors of that is the uh, health information exchange, uh, the ability to to, it, to pass that information back and forth between oh. team members is going to become much more important than it has been in the past. So having an electronic medical record might be part that's, of that. That's part of that. That's exactly right. Yeah. E-prescribing, uh, it's been shown to, to save tons of money uh, 
booth, I think Dr. Dobbs can attest to it, what he saw on the, uh, the state side of uh, medical savings and prescribing appropriately and making sure there's not duplications of services and that sort of thing. Also, there are safety issues too, that uh, electronic prescribing means that you don't have to try and read the scribble that uh, uh, a rushed uh, physician or a PA or nurse practitioner might be. Uh, I don't get calls from pharmacists much anymore because they can't good. read my handwriting. <laughs> right, right. That's, <laughs> well, and, and that's, <laughs> a, that's an important part because as we, if you're, you're talking about cost and, and whether you're talking about the nurse room or you're sure. talking about you know, bricks and mortar, you know, this you know, facility we're setting in, uh, typically we create an, an urgent care center over here sure. with the bricks and mortar. Then we have a physician's office. If this office closes at 5 o'clock, it's only open, what about Saturday and Sunday? I mean, if we start thinking outside of the, the walls and, and use our assets better, in other words, keep this clinic open longer um, by flexible scheduling, providing a service, um, electronic records allows me to, to, to refill prescriptions and do health care when I'm not physically in the, in the, yes. the office, uh, communicate with patients and actually see their, their history at the time. Yes. Uh, so it, it, it takes down those barriers that are currently and have historically been present of saying health care only occurs at the face-to-face -face office visit inside an office inside an exam room because healthcare could occur in a lot of other settings besides yes. that and, and that's been driven by our fee-for-service payment system right because you own, there's only you know this the assumption that healthcare only occurs when we're sitting across from some right. inside exam room inside a physical office and reimbursement is based on it's based on that face-to-face -face mm -hmm. encounter and, and so I think the the great promise for for a medical home payment outside of fee-for-service payment is it recognizes that and can fund those interchanges that could occur by phone, by, uh, you know, electronic means with a patient or, you know, outside that office setting. Very good. As far as your confidence, um, are you confident that the American healthcare system will reform in a way that is healthy? Well, that always remains to be seen, but I, I think uh, that the, the, um, the way that Americans typically respond to, to problems is in states of crisis, and, uh, and that's usually what it takes to, mm -hmm. to get people on board that uh, a change is necessary. And, and I think, yes, I, I am confident that you know, we'll figure it out, and we usually do. But it's going to take teamwork at, at all levels of, of government and within the healthcare field themselves. We need to step up to the plate and and uh, and promote and, and, uh, and rally for the change that we all know that needs to take place. Very good, Dr. Dobson. Well, yeah, I would I would agree. I think that um, gra gravity is a powerful thing, and, and gravity in this sense is that how things are. Uh, the healthcare system is a huge enterprise and there's a lot of interest involved. However, I think I, I'm probably more uh, inf uh, optimistic because of the gravity and the crisis we're in that we actually may get enough momentum that people will understand that everyone's going to have to change to make this work. Um, I, I think you've seen that within large integrated healthcare systems. There, there are some uh, you know, some pretty shining examples of healthcare systems who've reordered their business where it's not just about the in, you know, inpatient hospital system. Yes. It, it's, you know, it, most of healthcare really does occur in the community. Um, and it is really is, starts with primary care base and, and feeds its way up. And that reordering of, of priorities, you know, is important within the, the system. Uh, I think also understanding that insurers have to change, physicians have to sure. change, everyone has to change and, and and I think if we don't if we don't do it now I, I think you know we will regret it yes. and, and so I, I'm optimistic I think there's some positive signs that you know they're going to invest in primary care through the patient-centered medical yes. home they're, that we are addressing supply by you know looking at mid-level providers along with primary care physicians 
I think there's the recognition that there's a, a blended payment system needs to be uh, uh, in, you know, considered and maybe maybe we're really going to un unsilo the system a tad uh, mm -hmm. to create some collaboration locally around healthcare right. systems with uh, everybody working together in a collaborative way. Right. And right. you know that's you know that's the discussion about accountable care organizations of saying sure. you know it, it, it's not an insurance product it is you're responsible for your communities and there's some sort of shared savings model that goes with that. Very good. Well, this has been a very enjoyable conversation. Uh, Tom Earnhardt, yes. uh, physician assistant, and Dr. Dobson, it's been a pleasure uh, being here with thank you. you. And thank Thanks. you for joining us in Partners for Healthcare.